Yeah, my name is Flavien. Um, so I'm part of Boost, uh, so back in San Mateo. Uh, so I've been in the valley for about two months now. Uh, so I'm going to be here a little bit uh, for two more months. And uh, so I'm the, I'm the founder of Coin Prism. Uh, so Coin Prism, like uh, Tariq said, it's, um, it's basically the first production ready wallet for Cardot coins. And um, it's, um, yeah, so we will talk about that today and we will talk about the protocol called Open Assets. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I won't be talking about uh, Blueberry Pancakes. However, we can talk about Blueberry Pancake Coins, if you want. Um, and we will see that later. So, um, so yeah, so the, the agenda. Uh, so, we'll, so first of all, we'll explain what Cardot Coins are, because I'm sure some, some, of, them, some of you don't know uh, exactly what it is. Uh, we will dive a little bit more in the protocol. So this is something I don't usually present, but because you guys are so hardcore, I'm going to go into the details. And then, um, and then we'll talk about two extensions of the protocol. So, and then we'll finish with the demo. So, uh, what is what are Cardot coins? So, uh, the uh, the concept of Cardot coins is uh, about taking a small fraction of a Bitcoin, and in fact, it, it's the smallest fraction that can be transacted. So, it's about uh, 543 satoshis, I think. And so, taking that and then tagging it with some uh, additional uh, metadata which we put in an op return output, and then um, using that to track the, uh, the, this, this small fraction of Bitcoin through the blockchain. And that lets you uh, store and transfer uh, any type of assets, um, like as the same way you can transfer Bitcoins on the blockchain. So let's, let's go through, the, through uh, like an example so that you understand how the, the different actors interact and how, what the workflow is. So let's uh, let's say we have on the left we have a company called uh, Gold Bullion Corporation, and they offer a service which is that if you um, give them gold or buy gold from them, um, so this may sound familiar, um, you get a token that represents gold, and um, and then we have three users. So Alice and Charlie are users who have uh, signed up on that um, on the website of that company. So they've done address validation maybe, and you know they've uh, accepted the terms of service and everything. So they can use the service, uh, and Bob doesn't have um, doesn't have an account, so he does he cannot directly use the Gold Bullion Corporation. So now let's say that Alice has a bar of gold, and uh, she wants to uh, send it to uh, to the Gold Bullion Corporation, or maybe she just buys it directly for cash. So she gives it to to that company, and then as per the terms of service, the company creates a gold coin and gives it to Alice. So now Alice has this coin that represents uh, the value of, uh, of a bar of gold, and she uh, and you know if the price of gold goes up, then the value of this coin technically should go up, and vice versa. And then now let's say that uh, Bob wants to buy the coin. So Bob doesn't have an account, however, he can buy the coin from Alice. So you know they would just agree on the trade, and then um, Alice would give the gold coin, and then Bob would give the the Bitcoin to Alice. And all of this can be done on the blockchain. Actually, it can be done in a single transaction, uh, like an atomic swap. And then now Bob has uh, some exposure to, to gold. He kind of decreased his exposure to, to Bitcoin. So if the price of Bitcoin varies, he's still shielded against that. And uh, what's interesting is that Bob doesn't have an account. Uh, he doesn't have an, maybe he lives in a country where he cannot have an account, or maybe uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, he, doesn't, he cannot sign up or something, and, but yet he is, can still use the service indirectly by buying a token from somebody, somebody else. Um, and uh, so this is very, very interesting uh, because it kind of uh, makes services available everywhere. And, and then Bob has the ability to sell the coin whenever he wants to. If he doesn't want the, the gold coin anymore, he can sell it back to Charlie. And now Charlie has the gold coin, and because he has an account with the uh, uh, Gold Bullion Corporation, he can exchange it back for uh, gold, or maybe he can settle in cash. And so you can see that um, there's business, business models for everybody. So Alice and Charlie can uh, resell the coins and maybe make a little bit of a spread. And then you know Bob can access a service that he usually wouldn't be able to access. So everybody has an advantage in, in using that type of system. So how do we make sure that guy with green doesn't start sending around or selling that little green token he has? Yeah. So uh, so basically you need you need some out of band uh, proof of uh, you know reserve or. Usually, you would just use you know a company you trust. Like if it's let's say uh, you know a bank that everybody trusts, and they are issuing dollar coins, um, then yeah you you know that they're not going to default, uh, probably not going to default. And then um, yeah, so it, it basically you have to trust the company. So you know if it's a trusted name, then it's fine. Or maybe it's a company that uh, 
you know, that proves reserve or something like that. So, you know, but yeah, you're right. It kind of relies on trust. Yeah, you have to trust the issuer of the color coin. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah. Uh, so that, this is one use case, right? And you can apply this uh, this gold example to um, something like uh, fiat currency. So you can have a coin that's you know backed by uh, dollars or euros, and it, this would work the same way. So you would have uh, maybe a bank issuing a token backed by gold or uh, backed by uh, US dollar or euros. Uh, there's other use cases. So. The IPO is an interesting use case, and this is kind of a popular use case um, you know, at the moment. And the way it works is, uh, so if you're a business, you're trying to raise money, um, what you can do is create a coin, and then uh, start selling this coin for, um, to your investors. So whenever someone invests uh, some amount of money in the company, let's say every, every time someone invests $1, they get one coin back. Um, <coughs> And then this coin represents the investment in the company. And then what's interesting is that the investors can resell the coin uh, if they want to exit. Uh, so on Kickstarter, if you invest in a project and, and suddenly it's been a year and then the, the company hasn't delivered yet and you want to get your money back because you need to pay some bills, you cannot do that. Uh, if you have a coin, you can resell the coin to somebody else and then maybe not get the full amount, but you can still get some money back. So you know there's a free market that can organize around that. Uh, so this is quite interesting, but there are other features around that that can be used. So one of them is like uh, revenue, uh, like yeah, like dividends, so revenue sharing, for example. So if you're a company and you're making some revenue, uh, and you sold your color coins and you want to share the revenue, you can very easily uh, do that by examining the blockchain, <coughs> looking at all the addresses that uh, own a specific, like your specific coin. Uh, so this is a public ledger, so everybody can look at the blockchain and see that. And then, um, so they make a list, basically, or your wallet basically would make a list automatically for you. And then they would see how many share uh, is on every address, and then make a single Bitcoin transaction that sends the revenue to all those addresses. So every share would get like uh, maybe one percent of the revenue, or whatever you know, whatever number of percent uh, per share there is. <coughs> So this is a way to distribute uh, like revenue uh, in, in an anonymous way, basically, um, because it's still on, it's, everything is on the blockchain. Um, and then you can extend this by uh, sending uh, instead of sending dividends, you would send um, instead of sending Bitcoin as dividends, you would send a special new coin that you could create, which would be a vote coin. And then everybody then has one vote. Every time they have one share, they get one vote. And you can then um, instruct the uh, the people that they need to send those vote coins to one of two addresses, so depending if they want to vote for A or B, let's say. And then at the end of the vote, you just uh, count the balance in vote coins in every of those addresses and see which one has the biggest balance, and that's the winner of the vote. <coughs> So this is also an interesting way to organize a vote. And uh, you can also have a free market uh, for that vote. So if somebody is not interested in, vote, in voting, but somebody is willing to pay some money for a vote, then you, you know, they can make a trade and you can buy the vote. So this is also quite important. Foundation has some problems doing you know, blockchain-based voting recently. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the things that Greg Maxwell was saying was that you can literally have miners you know, put a tax or you know, a set by attack um, you know, a colored coin type voting mechanism. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. By either withholding mining from, you know, or you know, skipping any transactions that have these types of color coins in them. Um, you know, how do you avoid being attacked? You know, particularly voting on even things like you know blockchains that are not predictable. Like voting has to open or close at a certain time. How do you, you know, how does that work given you know, a lot of those constraints? Yeah. So there's yeah there's two things. So the first thing it would be like the miners attacking and maybe censoring some transactions. And actually this is a hard problem. You know the miners they kind of have the power here. If they want to censor some transactions, it's hard to prevent them from doing that. Uh, but maybe one way to kind of shift that is to you know have some uh, pool, uh, have some higher transaction fees for those transactions so that some miners would the miners who are not corrupted they would say okay I'm going to take the higher transaction fee and I'm going to include that in the block. But so yeah, if you have fifty more than fifty percent of the of the of the main <coughs> sorry more than fifty percent of the miners who uh, want to censor the transaction, then it's gonna it's gonna be harder. But as long as you have a small portion of the miners willing to include it, it's gonna take uh, it's gonna take more time, but it's gonna come in the transaction in the blockchain. Yes. So another option is if the people who are doing the voting are willing to uh, expose their public keys, then they can just send the public keys to whoever is telling the votes. And then they can use that to verify based on the hashes of the, the hashes of public keys to see the addresses with all those colored ones. 
Um, so in that case, they don't have to make a transaction. Is that what you mean? Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess, I guess it can also work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So that's kind of two use cases. Other use case would be loyalty points. So um, assuming, let's say that Starbucks more starts accepting uh, Bitcoin payments. Um, and uh, so whenever you make a payment in Bitcoin, the merchant can see which address it's coming from. So what they can do is uh, create some Starbucks coins, let's say, send it back to your, put back to the same address automatically without having to do anything. And then maybe that coin you can already meet for coffee later. Um, <coughs> And you can so so this is a way to create a, a loyalty system very easily. But isn't loyalty points essentially like the ways on the balance sheet of the company that's issuing them? Yes, yeah. And if they are like they are not issuing them, then they are not really loyal points. Say again. So if if they are the liabilities on the balance sheet of the issuing company, why would any company want to not be able to control that liability? Why would any company issue any other coin on any blockchain that they can't essentially pull back or devalue? I mean, because most companies oh. that have a lot of coins essentially use them to devalue their value. Yeah, they can definitely devalue the coin if they want to, so they can just print more coins as they go, you know? They right, like a government. So why would any company want to do something like put it on a blockchain? Uh, so it's, it's useful if you don't have, okay, if you're Starbucks, you probably have an IT team and a team of developers, I would assume. Uh, but if you're a small business, you might you don't have those resources. You don't have uh, you know you cannot build a custom loyalty program. So the blockchain is an easy way to get started. Uh, you just you know all the tools already exist. You know there's a mobile wallet. Uh, you can already do everything, um, and there's no you know don't need an IT team. You just need one person to spend an hour, and then that's it. So it's it's kind of a, like a lower barrier. He still has this liability that has no control once it's issued that token. So what do you mean by no no control over? You can't, I, I can't revalue that token, I can't bring it back. No, you can, you can devalue it by printing more coins, right? You can create more coins or you can change the term of, terms of the coin. If you started saying that the coin was worth $1 mm -hmm. uh, and you want to devalue it, you can, you, you, know, you can say, okay, now it's only 80 cents. You can absolutely do that. I mean, it's up to the issuer to, to say what, it, what it's worth. Obviously, if you are completely, uh, you know, if you're doing some, if you're dividing the price by 10, people are going to kind of lose trust. People are probably not going to use your system anymore. So it's, there's still a question of trust. But as long as you're doing something reasonable, you can still, you know, you can change the terms of the, of the coin. That You're controlling the redemption, right? So if you're Starbucks, you're the one accepting the coins and giving coffee in exchange. So if, if tomorrow you start saying, okay, now I'm only, I'm gonna take one more coin for a coffee, then you know, nobody can stop you from doing that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you can, you do have control then on the, on the, on the liability. Um, yeah, so smart properties, uh, it's uh, another interesting use case. So uh, this is more of a long-term uh, sort of use case, but let's imagine a car which has a special ignition system. It doesn't work with the key. It works with a, um, uh, like basically it can scan your colored coin wallet and it can see that you have um, a special colored coin that's bound to the car. And if you do, then the car will start, but otherwise it doesn't start. So that gives you a way to transfer the ownership of the, of the car uh, of, over the blockchain, basically. So this is kind of a more long-term thing because it's, uh, I mean, I don't see that being implemented in the short term, but uh, this is, there is like a lot of interesting applications like controlling systems like DNS and so on using colored coins. Uh, this is something that can be done. This, this falls in the category of smart properties. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about uh, open assets. So, well, colored coins at the base is, uh, is, is a broad concept, right? It was invented in, um, I think in 2012, was kind of described in a blog post, and then um, was the concept of taking outputs and you know, matching them with some value, but it's a broad concept, so there are many ways to do it. And open assets is one of those uh, implementations, so it's the, one, the main one at the moment. And uh, so it's based on, uh, on, uh, on the Bitcoin network, although you can apply it to any uh, blockchain that's uh, a fork of Bitcoin. So it could work on Litecoin and Dogecoin and so on. Um, so and on top of open assets, uh, there's many things that can be built. The first one, um, wallets. Uh, so this is the first important part. Uh, so if you want to be able to, if you want the users to be able to interact with the, uh, the current coins, you need wallets. So CoinPrism is one of those wallets. Um, exchanges, so if you want to, let's say, exchange uh, some, um, some Bitcoins for gold coins or some uh, Starbucks coins for sandwich coins, you can use an exchange. Um, 
uh, gateways are uh, those companies that uh, would like uh, essentially issue the coins, so Starbucks in the example, or the gold company, or uh, a bank. So any any company creating a color coin is a gateway, and there's also like like we saw there's uh, interesting business models. And then uh, merchants, uh, they could accept payments in colored coins. So let's say you have a, co a coin that's more stable in value than, uh, than Bitcoin, which, you know, a gold coin or a, a dollar coin would be probably more stable than Bitcoin. So in that case, you can accept that as a payment. And, um, and then you, don't, uh, you, you have all the benefits of cryptocurrency, so you don't have chargebacks, and also you pay lower fees than credit cards. Uh, but you don't get the, um, the volatility of Bitcoin. So th this is kind of... Uh, this is kind of the, the best of both worlds. Um, so yeah, this is this is different like different business models that can work uh, on top of that. So using those uh, uh, asset ledgers uh, like open assets. And so now we'll we'll go in a little bit into more of the details of open assets. So okay, so basically, so when you have an address today in Bitcoin, this address has a balance in Bitcoin. And uh, this, is, this is denominated in Satoshis. Um, and it, with colored coins and with open assets, you, you not only have a balance in Bitcoin, you also have a balance uh, in other assets. So in that example, I have two other assets. And I have like one has 150 units, the other one has five units. And so essentially, you have a list of uh, assets with a list of, you know, with a, match, with a balance for every asset. Um, and yeah, essentially the way it works uh, is that every output, every Bitcoin output has two new characteristics, which are, um, so it, it doesn't exist on the blockchain per se, but it's kind of, a, it's, in a, it's an embedded consensus. Everybody who implements open assets will see those two characteristics. The first one is the asset quantity, which is how many units of the assets there is in the output. And the second one is the asset ID, which is, uh, so it's the hash of the script pub key that was used to issue the asset. Um, so if you you take an address, uh, which is you know a private key with a public key, you create a script pub key, which is a pay to pub key hash, and this is then you hash this again, and this is going to be your asset ID. So every private key can generate a different asset ID. But then if you reuse the same private key, uh, you can reissue the same asset over and over again if you want to. Um, and then uh, yeah, so the asset ID is represented in base 58 with a different version byte, so it starts with a capital A. Um, so those two characteristics are uh, added, um, like it's kind of it's part of the cons of the colored coin consensus, but it's uh, in addition to the already to the uh, the value, which is the number of satoshis and the script pub key of the actual output. So the coloring process is recursive, so we will see that a little bit, uh, I think, in the next slide, and it works in two phases. So every uh, transaction for every transaction. Uh, so every transaction that is a valid open asset transaction is going to have a special output, which is an up return output, which is called the marker output. Um, so we'll see that actually just now. Uh, but let me talk about uh, first the recursive process. So let's say I have a wallet. Uh, I have some outputs in this wallet. And I want to know uh, um, what is the balance. Let's say, I, I want to know what is the, um, the, the asset ID and asset quantity of this output. Uh, so you can already know by looking at the transactions what's the value and what's the um, uh, what's the script up key. But I, won't, I also want to know the uh, the asset ID and asset quantity. So in order to know that, I need to find uh, the transaction it belongs to. So I'm going to fetch that transaction, and uh, that transaction in this example happens to be a transfer transaction. So it means that the color, like the color or asset ID of the output, depends on the asset ID of the input. So that means I need to get the previous transaction again to uh, to figure out the uh, asset ID of this output. Now this transaction is again a transfer, so I need to go back even one more. And now I get to the issuance transaction. So in the issuance transaction, uh, the output doesn't depend on the input. So I uh, I know already what the asset ID is, so I can uh, answer that question. And then by applying the process recursively, I, I can find the asset ID of this um, of this uh, this output, <coughs> and then here asset ID of this output, and this is how I get to to uh, figure out what is the uh, asset ID of the uh, output in my wallet. So now I know this is let's say a green, green coin, and there is like 150 units in it. So let's see now in the in more details how it works for uh, every uh, single transfer transaction. 
So the assumption is um, is that I have the um, asset ID and asset quantity of all the inputs in the transaction. If I don't have that, I basically apply this recursive process until I have it. And then the, the, uh, the outcome of this process will be that I know the uh, asset ID and asset quantity of all the outputs of this transaction. So first I need to identify the marker output. The marker output is going to have uh, no return. Uh, it's going to be a no return output. A and, and it's going to start with this, uh, this sequence of bytes. So this is op return, right? So the first byte, uh, 6a, is the op return operator. The next one is push data. And then, and then we have four bytes, which are kind of constants, which mark uh, this as an open asset transaction. The first one is 4f41, which means it's basically OA in uh, ASCII, so open asset. This is for identifying the transaction as open asset. And then the next one, 0100, is the version number. Then we have more, um, we have like an import, the other, the second one is the import, important part of the, um, of the marker output. So it's an array of values, of integer values. Uh, and so this byte here is the length of the, uh, of the array, so three. And then, and then there's the actual array. So it's encoded in a variable length integer. So the integers have uh, the minimum size they can have, like usually it's, uh, it's, it's quite compact. Because every byte here is going to be committed on the blockchain, so we want it to be compact. So the first output in the example, uh, the, yeah, the first um, the first value is AC02, which is uh, 300. So this this encoding is um, is used in protocol buffers. So there's code that exists so you, so that you can encode and decode uh, those values. So I'm not going through the details here, but basically, yeah. So the first value is 300. The second one is zero, and the third one is like this large number. And then, so this is the important part. Uh, we'll see how it's used later in just the next slide. And then the last part is just additional metadata that could, you can put in the op return. So this is the length of the metadata, four bytes. And this is the arbitrary metadata. So it doesn't matter what it is, one, two, three, four, five, six here. Uh, but we'll see it's used in some uh, extensions of open assets, uh, but it's optional, so you don't have to use it. You can use it if you want. But it's not important for the uh, uh, accounting part of open assets, like the core protocol. So now we have those three numbers that we extracted from the marker output. And we map those numbers to the outputs of the transaction. So the first output gets the number 300. So this was the first number in the array. The second output is the marker output, so we skip it. The third one has, was, a, was number zero. And then the fourth one was uh, 600,024 and, uh, and so on. So once we have mapped this number uh, to the outputs, we can start uh, the uh, like applying the, the transfer rules. So the transfer rules it's uh, so it's order based and it's kind it's not very complicated. So basically, it's easier explained by a picture. So this is the picture. Yeah, this is how it works. Um, yeah. So basically, you take the the first uh, like consecutive number. So there's five quantity five units in the input, so you carry over to the first five units, and then the one, the green is one more, is one more unit, which you carry over to the last output, which is one. Um, and then if you have this, though, um, you can see that the boundaries don't align. So like the, the third output, which is quantity three, would get a little bit of orange and a little bit of blue. So that that's, uh, would have two asset IDs. So in that case, uh, we consider the transaction invalid and all the outputs are uh, essentially uncolored. So in that case, the three orange coins and the two blue coins and the one green coin disappear because they are spent and they, they're not uh, carried over in this transaction. Uh, any questions so far? OK. The size of the up return. Yeah. Uh, usually, it's um, it's within 20 bytes. Usually, uh, but it depends depends on the number of outputs. You know, as you could see, the array can grow. So if you have many outputs, the array would be it can be you know maybe 20 20 entries, and in that case, it would get to 40 bytes. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, uh, there's only two outputs. So the, the one output for sending the color coins and one for change. So it's only two outputs. So usually, it's within 20 bytes. Um, yeah. So, so here, um, so this is basically how the, the core open asset protocol works. So it's quite simple. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we have extensions uh, which are optional. So the first ex extension is the asset address representation. And it's, it's, it's basically, 
kind of a convention that all the wallet providers uh, agree upon to prevent uh, accidentally uh, misspending the colored coins. Because if you misspend the colored coins, if you basically if you forget to include the up return, the marker output, then the transaction is invalid, the outputs are uncolored, and so you're destroying, coin you're destroying colored coins. So to avoid that, so essentially we don't want you to send your colored coins to, uh, I don't know, blockchain.info, and then blockchain.info spends it without the uh, marker output, so then you lose your colored coins. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to avoid that. So this this address uh, asset address representation is um, um, you know is supposed to do that, and the way it works is that um, so essentially we take the normal Bitcoin address and we prepend it with one byte, which is which we call the namespace byte. Uh, it's 19, but um, because uh, how base 58 works, uh, it's going to change the whole string completely. So it's going to look completely different. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not possible to, you know, just look at one address and create the other one. You have to actually run some code to do it. And uh, so this comes with two different rules. The f that it's kind of two. It's like the Fight Club. You know, there's two rules. And then the first one is that every wallet provider um, has to give. Uh, so for every Colored Coin wallet provider that supports Colored Coin, has to give the uh, asset address representation of the address. And the second rule is that every Colored Coin wallet should validate, uh, when it sends colored coin, it should validate that it's sending the colored coins to a, a spe special asset address representation. So combining those two rules, that means that if you try to send your colored coins to, um, to blockchain.info, it's going to it's it's tell you this is not a valid address because it's not in the asset address representation. So it's not going to let you do that. You, also, you cannot send it to Coinbase or to other uh, wallet that don't support colored coins. Uh, and at the same time, if you want to send it to a wallet that supports colored coin, then that wallet is going to give you the special representation, and then your wallet is going to agree on sending the colored coins. So this is solving that issue of uh, you know misspending the colored coins. And then the second extension is the uh, metadata layer. So so far we've been we've been speaking about assets having an asset ID. So this the assets are identified with an asset ID, which is the hash of the script pub key that was used to issue the asset. Um, but obviously, you know, it's hard to recognize uh, an asset by, by this long string of characters. So we want to associ associate the asset with uh, more information, so like a name, for example. This is kind of basic need. And the way it works is by using, using that uh, last field in the marker output that I was showing earlier, which has uh, you know, some space for arbitrary data. And so what, we, what you can do here is put a URL in that field uh, as you know like this example and then um, every wallet is going to fetch that URL and then this URL contains a JSON file like this one which contains some um, information about the assets so the first part asset ID is just to make sure that somebody else is not pointing on your asset ID on your asset definition I mean but um, the rest is uh, just information about the asset so there's a link to your website if you have a website as the issuer. There's a short name. Uh, there's you know name description, um, and then yeah, images and so on. So anybody can create name short and CPY. My company class A shares. My company limited. The only thing that would differ is the asset. Yeah. So yeah. So it would be you could create the same asset, but the asset ID would be different. And the second thing is that. Um, <laughs> If you see here, I mean not here, but if you point to um, to a HTTPS URL, uh, the wallet is going to essentially it's going to be a secure connection. So the wallet is going to look at the domain name and associate also the domain name to the asset. So in that case, uh, what is it? It's uh, well, well, we don't see it here, but yeah, let's say uh, you're pointing to Starbucks.com. Uh, so the wallet is going to see Starbucks.com. It's going to validate the certificate. And it's going to tell you, yeah, this this coin has been issued by Starbucks.com, and this is the information. And um, so this kind of associates securely the the coin with the domain name. So this is the same thing you have when you go to a website uh, like, uh, like your you know bank, bank online banking website. Uh, it shows you on the uh, on the address on the top. It's going to show you a green bar which says this is the this is we have verified the identity of this website and so on. So this is the same thing here. You can associate the coin and the wallet can verify the coin. Uh, it can verify that it has been uh, issued by the uh, by by this website. Well, well, can we verify that the certificate is good? They can verify that it's issued by that. So, so basically on the blockchain you have a link to the URL. 
So the wallet can get that file. Mm -hmm. It verifies the, uh, the domain name. And then that file, if you see on the top here, it has also the asset ID. So if I'm Starbucks, I'm going to put only the Starbucks, uh, the, the true Starbucks coins. So if someone tries to make a fake Starbucks coin and point to my, to point to my file, they're not going to show up in that, in that list. And so this is also invalid if you try to point to a, to a file and the asset ID is not in the list. And this is also, you know, red. But I can still create fake Starbucks coins pointing to HTTPS fstarbucks.com yeah. with a certificate, and somebody can go there and see that that certificate is for Starbucks coins, which has a name Starbucks. Well, he's saying that the asset ID is in the URL that's, that's being linked to in the asset. So yeah, but that one has coinprism.com, blah, 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 A4, whatever, that matches the asset so ID. So how will I tell the difference? If, if they're no. not linked to, if the asset ID is different than the asset ID that's in starbucks.com yeah. slash whatever, yeah. then the wallet won't make the link. Is that right? Uh, yes, but I think what you're saying is that you can create a website called fakestarbucks.com. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you can do that. But this is the same as a phishing attack. So you can create a bank of Amerina and then, you know, with a fake, uh, with a fake page and this is a this is phishing attack. Yeah, so this is the same attack as we have on the web. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, the, you know there's you ways to... you don't filter people. You don't do any service to filter who's actually creating assets. Anybody no. Can assets. Yeah, anybody can create any type of asset. So literally from coin prison, we can have bad actors serving up information to... People. Yeah. Yeah. So you can be a vector. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What if that JSON document changes after you know the first batch of wallets fetch it? So uh, yeah. So the wallets are the wallets should uh, like refresh the file from time to time. Um, so are there any of those fields that would significantly change the behavior of the, the asset after that? No. It's just uh, no. It's just informational. So it's just like. Uh, and it, no, nothing like nothing in this information uh, affects the functional part of the of the asset. And actually, if this disappears completely, then you still have some coins which are unnamed coins. You, know, you don't know what it is. It just has uh, an asset ID, but you still have the coins and you can t still transact. So you don't need that to transact. But this is used used for uh, displaying to the user some uh, information. Just to display it. Yeah, this is like presentation layer type of thing. Even like something like. Uh, yeah, divisibility is uh, so at the at the core level, everything is is an integer and everything has a number of units. Uh, but the divisibility is if you want to show, let's, it's like if we were showing satoshis everywhere, but then there was some additional uh, information that was saying, oh, eight, uh, you know, you use eight places, like a hundred million satoshis is going to make one bitcoin. So this is what this does. Display. Yeah, it's a display thing, you know. Some wallet could say uh, 100 million satoshis is is, uh, is a bitcoin, and some other wallet could say uh, a thousand or ten thousand uh, uh, satoshis are a bit or something. So you know, different wallets can use different divisibility. The same thing here. I mean, you can change the divisibility, so it's going to change the uh, it's going to move the the decimal separator, but it's not going to change the actual amount of units. If you see what I mean. <laughs> If you change the if you want to change the URL, yeah. yeah, you can issue you can do a new issuance and change the URL. So it only uses the last uh, last issuance. So you can see on the blockchain which one is the last, and that's the one you use. Yeah. Uh, I think that this is part of where where do you get the URL that this comes from? Uh, so this let me go back. This comes from here. This. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, you can put arbitrary data in it. So if you put a, a URL, actually U equals and then the URL, then this is going to be interpreted as the uh, as the metadata URL. So, so it has to be short enough to fit inside of it. Yeah, it has to be short, yeah, yeah. And it's just on the initial issuance or any subsequent transaction? Uh, no, just the issuance, yeah. So. Is the JSON file standard spec? Yeah, this is, uh, this is on GitHub. So I think if you go to openassets.org, you will find a specification for this format. Okay. Um, so when, you, when the wallet follows back to the reverse part to find the initial institutions, it pulled the URL that is the each transaction? 
So when it goes, when it backtracks the yeah, transactions, backtracks, yeah. Will you find the URL in the issue, or you have to keep that URL data in every transaction? Uh, no, no, it's only in the issuance transaction. So every, so the transfer transactions don't have to have the, uh, uh, the, because uh, you you might be transacting assets that don't belong to you, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I might be sending some uh, Starbucks coins, but I'm not Starbucks, so I'm not the one who can change the URL, so it has to be the, uh, the issuance. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the implementations of open assets, um, we have a bunch of wallets. So yeah, CoinPrism is the first one. Uh, so there's a web version, coinprism.com, and then there's an Android wallet, uh, you, which you can search for uh, CoinPrism on uh, the Google Play store and then it's going to show up. Uh, there's no iOS version yet. Uh, Power Wallet, which is uh, still in alpha, I think. It's a Windows-only wallet, but um, it's a completely independent implementation of open assets, and it's compatible. Um, and then Get Hashing, which is yet a, another one, uh, cloud.gethashing.com. I haven't tried this one. It's quite new, but uh, it's also another compatible implementation. And uh, so what's really interesting with open assets is that it's one of the few protocols that can afford having multiple independent implementations. Because the protocol is so simple that uh, it's, you know, it, it's easy to get right. So there's no there's no corner cases or there is con corner cases, but they are well documented. And uh, so the core implementation of the consensus code is a few hundred lines of code. And this is you know this is easy to port from one language to, to the other. And then this is why we have like three three or four implementations, uh, separate implementations of the protocol in different languages. Uh, and you know they are all compatible with each other. If you want to do programmatic uh, integration, uh, Color Core is um, it's basically a Python application which you can put on your on your server or your uh, your laptop, and then this connects to your local Bitcoin D node, and this is going to pull the transactions from Bitcoin D. So this is completely uh, trustless. So you only need Bitcoin. You basically get the blockchain from Bitcoin D, and then you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to trust any other, other service. It, this applies the uh, embedded consensus, and then uh, yeah, and then if you if you want more convenience, uh, you can use the Coin Prism API. So there's a link. Uh, the Coin Prism API is like um, it gives you information, like you can get the balance of an address, or you can uh, construct transactions, which would be issuing or transferring assets. Uh, you can get information about a specific asset and so on. And then there's nBitcoin, which is a .NET library. So it's actually the main uh, .NET library for uh, Bitcoin. So it does a lot of things like HD wallets, multi-sig, uh, stealth addresses. And it also has support for open assets. So if you use that, you already have support for open assets. And then there's more implementations, uh, I think, coming. Uh, there's other companies working on it. Um, so Coin Prism, um, so Coin Prism is a wallet. Uh, it's um, it's like a Bitcoin wallet, so it lets you store uh, and receive and send the Bitcoins. And also, you can store, receive, and send call out coins and even issue your own call out coin if you want to. And then there's a block explorer also, which is similar to blockchain info, uh, but with uh, asset information. So it, it gives you, like, tells you this transaction is uh, like some, somebody was sending uh, 10 Starbucks coins uh, from this address to this address. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to do a short demo now. Um, so this is the uh, this is Coin Prism. So uh, after you sign up, uh, so sign up. So this is very similar in the security model as blockchain.info. So you basically type a password, and then the password is used to encrypt the private key, and then the server stores the encrypted private key. And then if you lose your password, then you cannot decrypt the key anymore, and you lose everything. Uh, but then it's you don't have to trust Coin Prism with your keys, basically. Um, so. Uh, after you sign up, you, you see basically this page, and you have here uh, like an address. So this is the, the asset address. So this is the address you use to receive color coins. And then if you switch here, you can switch to the Bitcoin address. So if you want to send Bitcoins from Coinbase, uh, you would use this address. If you use this address, then Coinbase is going to tell you, no, this is not a valid address. Um, and then on, on the left, I have my balance. So I have a Bitcoin balance here. And then I also have some Starbucks coins. Uh, it's not the real Starbucks coins. And then I have some uh, some air miles here, uh, which also are not real air miles. Uh, so let's say I want to create some uh, some sandwich coins. So so let's see how to do that. Pizza. Okay. So so first I need to okay the Wi-Fi. Yeah. So I need to go to uh, addresses and colors. 
Um, so the, the first step is to create a private key that will be used to issue the uh, to issue the assets. It's not loading. Um, and then uh, this private key will be used for the issuance transaction. And uh, also, I will need to fund uh, this transaction so that I can. Okay. This is always the the right moment for uh, for the website to stop working. Or let me see if this works. Yeah. Well, okay. So yeah, okay. So this seems to be maybe working better. So yeah, mor moral of the story: always use Internet Explorer for your demos. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so I need to create this uh, this new address. So I'm going to click here, new color, and uh, I'm going to create. Uh, I'm going to type the uh, the name of the new asset. So it's a pizza coin. Could have been sandwich coin or anything else. And then I'm going to type my. Sure. Bitcoin dev coin. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're all going to get rich tonight. <laughs> um, and then so I type create, and then this is going to generate a private key on the client side, and encrypt it with the password. So now I can define this information. So this goes all in the JSON file we saw earlier. So uh, SF, OK, I'm going to copy. Oh, this is the short name. So SF uh, B, uh, BTC, let's say. Um, the short name is the name of a company, or uh, could be like who the issuer is. I can upload some image. And then finally, um, some description. Um, and then I can select the divisibility. So let's say we'll, st we'll leave it indivisible. And then the, the type, asset type, it, it's just uh, for you know informational purpose. It doesn't really have any functional impact. But let's say it's a crypto token. So I save this. And then um, now I need to find this address. So I'm going to go here. I want to send it to the uh, SF dev Bitcoin address. And I need to send a small amount so that um, I'm able to uh, create, to color the dust, basically. So I need a few satoshis plus enough for the transaction fees. So here I get a recap of the transaction. This is just a normal Bitcoin transaction still. And then, so yeah, once this is done, now I, I'm ready to issue the coin. So I'm going to go to SF Bitcoin Dev Coin and then uh, issue coins. And I can select the amount, so say maybe we're about 60 people, so I'll say 80 just in case, so everybody has a coin. And then, <laughs> and then yeah, and then I can define uh, which uh, asset metadata I want to use. So if I have my own website and I want to host my own JSON file, I can provide a custom URL, so I can put my URL here, HTTPS and so on. Uh, but by default, if you don't have a website, uh, you, for testing purposes, you can use uh, CoinPrism hosts it for you. So it's not recommended because you know we don't want to be uh, hosting your files, uh, especially you know uh, this is kind of uh, trust sensitive. So we don't recommend it. But if you want to test, it, this is fine. So here it's giving me a recap. So issuing AT uh, SFBTC, and then uh, again I sign the transaction. So. Transaction is being signed, and it's not confirmed yet. But uh, CoinPrism will reflect the unconfirmed balance, and so it's here. So 80 San Francisco BTC coins, and if I click View Profile, I get um, I get more information about the uh, the asset. Um, okay, so while this loads, so um, if I click here, I should be able to see the uh, transaction that was uh, used to issue the coin. Notice how, how this is still loading. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, okay, so 
I don't know if this slide I can show you, but yeah, basically the the, the, the transaction is now unconfirmed. But when it confirms, uh, the the assets will be uh, permanently issued, and then now I'm ready to to send uh, the coins um, over to any other address. Um, yeah, all well, this is another. Yeah, and then uh, you can also use the Android application. So if you want to, I, I could send this to my uh, to my phone, Android phone. And then you know you can do transactions across phones, and the phone application actually uh, leverages unconfirmed transactions. So uh, this is you know taking the assumption that if you're transacting face to face with someone, you're they're not going to try to to steal your money. Um, okay, this is loading. So this is the uh, information about the coin which I just entered earlier, and then if you look here, uh, well, okay. Well, it doesn't. It should. Yeah. So when it confirms, it's going to show me the uh, URL of the um, of the JSON file. Maybe we have it here. So this is, this is the JSON file. I can show you. Yeah. So this, if you can see, but so this is the JSON file we just created, and then uh, so the link to that file is going to be embedded in the blockchain. And then yeah, and then this is the issuance transaction. So this is, so I can actually open this transaction in any other explorer. So uh, to see blocker. So you can see the transaction is showing. This is the same transaction. It's unconfirmed, and it's here. Uh, so blocker doesn't show me that it's a Coinbase coin transaction because it doesn't know about Coinbase coins. Uh, but you can see, like, this is transferring 600 satoshis, which is the dust carrying the colored coins, and this is uh, this is the change, uh, or yeah, this is the change here. And then um, here, this is the same transaction, but it shows me that uh, there is some 80 coins issued sent to this address. So yeah, this is uh, this is basically how you create your coin. All right, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Questions? Um, are there opportunities that uh, people can uh, exploit for just coins, like say we're doing coins or things like that, to uh, do some sort of like token transaction or something like that? Like, is it numberbacks, but is there? Um, or the, like, uh, you, so it's as secure as Bitcoin, so you cannot steal coins from other people, you cannot... Uh, no, 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 you, you mentioned that... Uh, transaction would be essentially decoded. Oh uh, yeah so I mean this is I mean this is by your own you know, you know your own negligence that you wouldn't follow your points because you would you make a transaction that uh, you you're basically using your coin and wallet in a way that's not uh, compliant with card coins. Right. Usually you would have you would have a wallet uh, you would have like an address that's managed by your card coin wallet and that address uh, so that card coin wallet would not make like a, you know, but inadvertently, uh, you know, the, the in coral coins. So I mean, it's uh, no, there's not really. I mean, it's you have to be careful, I guess. You know, you know to. Well, actually, you know, if it, I mean, the the address scheme prevents you from making a mistake. So even if you're not careful, you're not going to uncover your coins by mistake. So yeah, I mean, if, I guess if you really want to uncover the coins, you can. But uh, by mistake, I don't I don't think that that can happen much yeah. anymore. I'm just thinking about changing the total number of coins that are issued, if there's voting rights associated with it, and, and there are thresholds for when you're able to vote, you can kind of like, it might be a little bit. Um, it's more for number. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess you can, uh, you can change the divisibility. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Uh, so it, yeah, I guess. Well, I guess voting software, if there is voting software that's built on top of that, would show maybe the number of units to be to be sure that uh, Nothing is because the number of units is is in the blockchain. There's no way to change it. It's like secure. Yeah. Uh, so if you yeah you would just use that I guess for voting. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so what if somebody somebody were to send regular bitcoins to this color address? Is the public key associated with this? It's not the original uh, originating transaction, but somebody else would just send in some coins there. Uh, how would this mixing happen? So. Can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. So the question is that you have this public uh, Bitcoin public uh, address for uh, for your colored asset, right? Yes. What if I want to send in just out of goodness of my heart some you know ten bitcoins to that? Oh well, if you, if you send ten bitcoins, it's going to be uh, yeah. an output that's not colored. Yeah. 
So it's just going to show up on your wallet as 10 Bitcoin. So it, same way here I have, uh, you know, here it shows me like I have this Bitcoin. So here you would have 10 Bitcoins appear, appearing. Okay. So how does that affect your, uh, you mentioned that all the transactions going forward for the color Bitcoins, they're all recursive, right? So you, you, you go yeah. backwards to find yeah. out where, where the owner is. How yeah, does so that affect that process? Yeah, that's a good question. So if I uh, go back to my slide here. So in the case of uncolored uh, Bitcoins, you would just go back one step and then this, this one would be a transaction that doesn't have a no return, so it doesn't have a colored coin marker. And so by, uh, you know, by the rules of the, uh, of the protocol, that means that all the outputs are uncolored. So the recursion would stop at the first step and you would know that it's uncolored. Uh, uh, and current Bitcoins. Okay, so one follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, how does that scale? So let's say I issue like a million color coins and then some people send in, just, just to mess with me, some people send in like tons and tons of Bitcoins over there, like you know, millions of Satoshis. And then you go through, let's say, hundreds of you know, transactions deep. How does the scale serve in terms of transacting you know, one incremental so you would make like a million transactions? Yeah. Yeah, so a million transactions would probably cost you a lot of money, so... Well, once a transactions, you know, Yeah, but you still have to pay the fees if you want with transactions to go in the blockchain. Yeah. So the fees, yeah, it would go to maybe like 10 or 100 Bitcoin, something like yeah, that. Yeah, but in theory, the, the cost of the asset, let's say you're, you're transacting, you're, you're using this as a marker for the land, which may be much more expensive. So I might be willing to, let's say, spend a million dollars to mess with your scheme. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to take more time to do the backtracking, mm -hmm. but uh, generally it's pretty fast because you, you know, you can, first of all, you can do it in parallel, so it's like a tree travel song, but you can do it in parallel. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, it's, it's quite fast, and um, you know, the, your Bitcoin node traverses all the transactions in the blockchain. Uh, here we only need to traverse maybe 0.01% of all the transactions. So this is, you know, if you're, if your Bitcoin D can do it on, on the laptop, you know, it, it runs fine on, fine on the laptop, and this is going to be also probably fine uh, if you only need a fraction of that. Even if you try to make a large scale attack, you're only going to create like 0.01% of all the transactions in the blockchain, unless you're spending really a lot of money. Uh, and even if, you're, even if all the transactions in the blockchain are yours, this is still working because that's what you do today with Bitcoin D. So. It's going to be expensive for little returns. Yes? So I, I heard of another color point idea that used a, just a convention at each transaction, but maybe a simple convention would be that the first output gets all the color points. Or yeah. like that. Is, there, is there an advantage to using this system where you have to kind of use a more explicit indication? Of yeah, so the one you described works for uh, single units, uh, like assets, which would be one unit. So um, this actually works for maybe uh, like the car example. Because in the car example, you only need one car key probably, or maybe two or three. But uh, you, only, you don't need to have like a integer, you don't need millions of them, and you don't, you don't need to be able to split them. So what you're describing actually uh, works in that case. So if you, let's say the coin always goes to the first output, like you said. Uh, so yeah, this works, but if you need something like uh, more complex accounting, so you need to, count grams of gold or dollars or shares in the company, uh, then then you need some, some way of, uh, you cannot just say it goes to the first output because well, there are some issues with that, like um, the backtracking would not be as efficient, so you would basically have to, end up, you would be end, ending up parsing all the transactions in the blockchain, so we, going back to that, it would scale much less, uh, much you know, much worse. Uh, but if you are only transacting one coin at a time, like only one coin, then this can work out. Yeah. This is just a more, it's like a narrow, narrower um, like use case, but this can work if, it, if it's that's... It's just like an efficiency concern that it ends up, it ends up becoming more computationally difficult if you do that way? Yeah, essentially I think it's yeah, computationally yeah. difficult. Yes, yeah. How do people use the coin zone in the real world? Uh, so this is a good question. So there is, a, so there was a crowd sale in some case, so there is, uh, it's, a, it's not a company, it's like a community, or I don't know if it's a non-profit, or I don't think it even has. A, it's called Get Hashing, and they basically buy mining hardware. So they have a forum, and they, it's uh, very active. They buy mining hardware, and they sell shares of the mining power. And then uh, every share is like 10 giga hash. And the first batch that they were selling, they sold uh, $100,000 worth of coral coins in, uh, in a week. Uh, so that was in February. And then I think they're just doing the second batch now, so we'll see how this one goes. 
but uh, that's one use case. Um, other use cases, so there's like a company creating a gold back front coins called Icon Capital, so they're using that also. Um, there's, um, yeah, so crowd sales is, is, a, is a big use case. So there was a hair salon in Australia also, which did a crowdfunding campaign using crowd coins. So they wanted to open a new store in, uh, in Sydney, and so they raised some money to open the store. How much? Uh, they raised only a few thousand dollars, so I don't, it wasn't enough for them, but, but that was, was yeah, it was a start for them. So. Thousand, one, two, uh, I think like two, three thousand, yeah. And they use your platform? Yeah. And yeah. you guys monetize that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there a way that initial issuance to say there will never be any other issuances in the same asset so you can you know, commit yourself to not doing further issuances? So there's no way per se to do that, but what you can do is uh, you can destroy the private key. Okay. So then you know that you're, if you're worried about theft, let's say, or if you, you know, if, yeah, for security reasons, you would destroy the private key. If you want to prove to other people that uh, you can't issue more coins, uh, actually, the, the, the thing is that it's not actually useful to prove to them that they cannot issue more coins because, uh, let's say I'm a, I'm a company, like I'm a, you know, trying to pull off a scam or something, and I say, a thousand, uh, I say okay, I'm going to create a thousand coins and there's only going to be a thousand of them, so here's the price. And then, uh, and then I, I block the, uh, the issuance. What I can still do is create a, another, another, another asset with a thousand units and then sell it uh, like with the same terms, which is the same as creating a second, like 2,000. This is the same thing, like in terms of uh, economics, it's the same, the same thing. So you, they would have to, you know, I would, let's say I have a thousand grams of gold and I want to back, uh, I want to back those coins. I, I have a thousand coins, want to back it with a thousand grams of gold. I could create another asset, create a thousand asset B, and back it with the same reserve. And you know, it's the same as creating 2,000 uh, units in the first well, place. If they're claim checks for a reserve, but if they're some other sort of limited privilege, voting privilege, um, some sort of uh, rival risk good where people can't call, you don't want too many members of your country to um, um, It isn't quite the same. I mean, there's a, there's a nice quality of having a guarantee. But of course, everybody could see a second issue. So maybe the culture could be, I only care about things that stay pure from the first issuance. Uh, I mean, people could do that as a convention, but it sounds like the software would let them mix. Yeah. The also, the thing you can do if you have a group of, uh, of people uh, which, kind of, which kind of trust themselves as a group and they want to issue a coin that they use between themselves, what you can do is, let's say it's 100 people, they can create a multi sig, um, like, a multi-sig uh, script, which is like uh, 100 out of 100, and then if uh, one, p you know, and everybody is supposed to destroy the key, but the only thing you need is one person to destroy the key for the issuance to be completely stopped. So if you de destroy your key, then you know that nobody is going to be able to create the same points again. So if the group of people is closed like this, or if it's uh, if there's it's like basically trusted setup, if you can have a trusted setup, then it also works. You can probably uh, block operations, but yeah. Final question? Yes, John. Um, um, well, uh, uh, this, this is going to be two different questions. The first one will be really fast, though. How do, how do color coin mobile wallets work? Um, so right now, it's uh, it's not SPV. It's just calling an API. Uh, if that was, your, I guess your question was, is it SPV, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just calling an API. Uh, but it would be possible to make an SPV wallet. So. The SPV wallet would have to do the backtracking on the client side, yeah. and then you could do that. Uh, you could use the SPV interface and then do the backtracking, so it would be a little bit slower than a normal SPV wallet, but it's it's still possible. Um, and you but probably yeah. just want to do that on Wi-Fi, right? Um, yeah, not sure. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, it depends on the yeah, maybe. But SPV like already requires some bandwidth, but. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't do the math, so I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but like in theory, it's possible. Maybe. Okay. And what I'm really interested in is: Have you thought about like, does the secure is the security model of Bitcoin broken if the value of assets that are issued onto the Bitcoin protocol are greater than like the market cap value of Bitcoin? As yeah. So the yeah. This is a yeah. This is a good question. So the incentives could be broken. Yeah. 
uh, if that was the case. But if that was the case, I think, let's say we have Apple issuing shares on the, on the blockchain, which is like, I don't know, like 200, uh, mil, uh, 200 billion dollar valuation, something like that. Whereas 600, 600, okay. Whereas the blockchain is like, it's not even, or it's a few, bi few what? Few, mm. three, three, four billion. Three, four billion, yeah. So the way it would work is that the transaction fees would have to become uh, proportional to the uh, assets transacted. So if the miners would have to have some intelligence about the valuable assets on the blockchain, and if they see a transaction, transfer, uh, transaction transferring, I don't know, a million dollar of, uh, of Apple shares, they would, rate, they would ask for a higher fee, like uh, maybe uh, you know, 0.1% 0 0 of, of, uh, of the value of those assets. Uh, so then that, that would break, the assumptions would, would be right again, because uh, the more value there is in blockchain, the more fees they would get, and so the more hardware they would be. Um, we're already at halfway, the value of the assets in the blockchain, already halfway to the value of um, market capital of Bitcoin, and you don't know. So yeah, I will gladly say that miners have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, if a bank or something starts doing serious, you know, hardware yeah. billion dollar so, yeah. transactions, and low Bitcoin, that's right. So, yeah. All right. Um, that was awesome. Thank you very much.